I, def I definitely wanted to thank you guys for um, just your patience in all of this. I know this Zoom thing is fatiguing <laughs> after a while. And um, I just want to also let you know we're having some conversations this week about what the summer looks like for our church. And um, there's just a lot of, we've gotten some preliminary uh, governor's uh, orders that just kind of got leaked um, about how churches are gonna need to operate. And um, until we hear it for sure uh, this next week, we're just, we're just gonna, we're gonna let you know some stuff, let's just say in the next week or so about what this looks like, but it's going to be um, um, just, just patience on our part as a church. And, um, and we'll, we'll have that conversation some more in the weeks ahead. Um, I wanted to, first of all, uh, just acknowledge that it's um, Pentecost Sunday. And in the church calendar, um, this is the length of time after the resurrection in which um, the Holy Spirit was given to the believers on that, on that day that we read in Acts. And um, as a church, universal, um, we just kind of link arms with all believers across the world in remembering just what a moment that was and how, as the Holy Spirit is alive and active, in those of us who follow Jesus. And um, that is a significant thing. And we're gonna talk more about how significant that is today. But I, I also wanted to recognize just, there's just a lot on my mind. Uh, one of those things on my mind is Elliot and Jen and the Henshaw family. And, um, you know, it's just a wild thing. We got to spend some time with Elliot and Jen as a leadership team this week. and um, all of us are going to get to celebrate the Hinshaws and what they've meant to our church over the last six years. And it's almost six years really to the day. Uh, Elliot started on staff with us June 1st of 2014. And Elliot and Jen were just married about seven, eight months before. And um, there's so much to their story coming out here that it really was the hand of God. And so we just, continue to trust that this is also the hand of God leading them in this direction. And so I was just thinking back 300 Sundays, 300 plus Sundays that Elliot has um, led worship in our church. And the, the lame part is the last 12 have had to been, had to be online. And so we are just, as many of you know, we are going to have them back and celebrate with them live. Elliot's going to lead again um, for our church live one day here in the future. So um, yeah, it was a little teary today here at the house. Um, big hugs, you grown men hug, even at, during pandemics. And um, we just love the Hinshaw so much. Um, so listen, uh, today, here's what we were going to do. We were going to talk about Ephesians 2, I mean, sorry, Ecclesiastes 2. Uh, and the conversation is about the teacher wanting to, uh, talking about how he tried everything in his life to bring him fulfillment. And so my goal was to talk um, a little bit about the events that happened and are happening this week in response to. Um, George Floyd's um, death at the hands of uh, that police officer. And I was going to, here's what I was going to do. I was going to talk about that for a bit. And then I was going to preach a ser sermon on Ecclesiastes. And, um, and you can ask Angela, I've just been kind of nuts this week. Um, trying to figure out I've just been in my head a lot. So this morning, um, usually I get up really early on Sundays just to go over some things and just have some quiet and get my head right. 
and I couldn't shake the need for us to talk about this as a church. And not just to do a little thing and a little prayer. And so one of the things that's maybe um, something you, you struggle with too, is there something in me that resists, I, I want to resist pain. And, um, and this whole episode that, that happened this week has um, a lot of pain to it. And so I have been uh, frustrated, um, angry, um, and at the same time, trying to literally escape thinking about it. Um, and which I have, based on where I live and who I am, I have the ability to, to do that. And, I, you know, I'm tempted sometimes to um, just kind of numb myself off and escape. Um, I'm reading a book and I'm listening to a book right now, so I have a lot of things to distract me. Um, but as I've been talking with some friends and talking with some fellow pastors and some Arvada police officers, um, I've just been really struck with um, some things in my own life that I'm just wrestling with. And here's the thing, if you're tempted um, to think that scripture is quiet and that churches should be quiet and silent about racial and social issues. Um, I can understand that you're tempted to think that, but scripture's full of this. And um, it starts off at the beginning that you and I are made in God's image with no superiority, um, uh, superiority amongst races. Like in the garden, there was uh, Imago Dei. We're made in the image of God. And God promises Abraham that he's going to be a blessing to all nations, not just his own. And, I mean, you just move along. Jonah, uh, Jonah like literally hates a group of people and God sends him anyway. Uh, the Old Testament prophets, it, it, if you haven't had a chance to read the prophets, um, the Old Testament prophets rage, like literally rage against Israel and Judah because they were ignoring social issues. They literally raged. Read Isaiah. Read Amos, Micah. God's anger for ignoring um, is, is kind of terrifying because I think for a, a chunk of my life and for pockets of my life, I've tried to ignore things. I've tried to pretend that um, it's not as bad as it we think it is. I don't want to believe it's true. Um, later on in scripture, the people try to kill Jesus when he reveals God's heart for people of all races and backgrounds, not just Jews. And then there's this scene of Jesus with the woman at the well, which is a massive statement on Jesus uh, from Jesus about race and um, gender. The parable of the Good Samaritan has been kind of... Um, felt boarded a bit in our churches where it's about um, being a nice helper when really there's a depth of why the Jews hated the Samaritans at the, at the bedrock of it. And Paul emphasizes Jesus's vision for all people being equal in Galatians 3 and this beautiful picture in Revelation of, of every tribe and every tongue. And I say that all of this because, I mean, as a white dude, and I'm thoroughly a white dude, I, uh, I grew up in the suburbs. And I'm actually really embarrassed by by how much I have to learn.
Oh, this is even more awkward on Zoom. By how much I have to learn about God's heart for people who are not like me. And guys, I get it wrong all the time. So, uh, here's the thing. Scripture teaches about uh, race. And because Scripture talks about this stuff, if we follow Jesus, we have to as well. And the Bible is much more than Jesus died for me. And you know my whole thing on a personal relationship with Jesus thing. The gospel is so much bigger than that. Um, read Mark 1. Read Matthew 4. Read Ephesians 1. Jesus' definition for the gospel, the good news, is massive. It's exciting. It's an exciting vision, and it pushes far beyond accepting Jesus around a campfire at a church camp. It's much bigger than that. And all that stuff's good, but it's much bigger than that. And so race and social issues are not a peripheral thing to God. I hear someone mowing the lawn, I think. Um, it's not a peripheral thing to God. Um, and here's the thing. Uh, let's let's just let's just be clear. The, the prophets talk about injustice as a false balance. The prophets talk about injustice as weights. All throughout the prophets, and when the weights are imbalanced, that is unjust. And here's what's hard. We have enough historical evidence to realize that both political parties have no clue how to deal with human hearts. And finding a political system that will never prevent evil and racism and motive and actions is impossible. In fact, that is humanism. Following Jesus in his teaching will make a difference. And that is what Jesus, at the bedrock of what it means to follow Jesus, he says we must lay down our lives. And that includes speaking up, and that includes, um, here's, the, here's the thing that includes for some of us, and this may be you and, may, and me as well, that we want to be, def we feel defensive because we're white. We feel defensive um like oh I, I is it is that something i really need to step into is that something i really need to pay attention to and the prophets say yes because it's an imbalance proverbs 11 1 says that it's a false balance and that a false balance is an abomination to the lord but a just weight is his delight that God actually delights in balance, in equal, in justice. And the question I'm asking myself is if I don't feel the false balance, um, there's, there's something I need to go to the Lord with on that. And I'm, I'm reminded of what Isaiah says, uh, in chapter 59, this is Isaiah 59, 9. He says, therefore, justice is far from us. And righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light and behold darkness and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. He says, we grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight. Among those in full vigor, we are like dead men. We all growl like bears. We moan and moan like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. 
Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. And so this is not a conversation today that says, um, I'm trying, not trying to make you pick sides or push this or push that or anything like that. I'm trying to ask, like, where do we need to sit with this and lament? Um, and I thought it would be really good to read you a letter. Um, this is a letter from the president of our denomination. We are a part of a family of churches. And this family of churches called the Evangelical Covenant Church all over the country some inner city churches, some rural churches, some ethnically diverse churches, some suburban churches like us. And I just thought this letter was really powerful. And what I'm going to ask is, as I read this, will you do me a favor and try not to like argue it, try not to, try not the yeah buts to come in your mind. Try to just feel it. And this is John Wenrick. He is, he's a white dude like me. In fact, he planted Applewood Covenant Church that's in Golden about 25 years ago. And here's what he writes. He starts with a de definition of what a pandemic is. And he says, pandemic, adjective, occurring over a wide geographic area and affecting an exceptionally high proportion of the population. Synonyms widespread, prevalent, pervasive, rampant, universal, global. He says, we're in a pandemic, but not the one you're thinking about. This is not the one that has recently taken the lives of almost 100,000 Americans and infected millions worldwide. Though this, that does continue to be a concern and is important. The pandemic we're talking about is a disease that has plagued humans since the fall of humankind. Like most infectious diseases, this deleterious organism, once in the system, morphs and develops, resistant to treatments over time. It is a disease that we can be infected by and be latent carriers of without noticing its terminal effects. This disease manifests itself in many different forms and has claimed an incalculable number of lives. Sometimes this pandemic shows up in colonial conquest and leads to mass genocide. Sometimes it rears its ugly head through sexism and the exploitation of women. It has the power to distort our vision, seducing us into believing that certain people are not equitable, equ equitably endowed with the Imago Dei and that others are disposable and inherently criminal. Despite a wealth of historic evidence highlighting the effects of this pandemic, too many Christians seem impervious to the ways sin fosters institutional just injustice and economic in inequalities that leave so many people walled off from the shalom God intended all of us to enjoy. How many atrocities have been committed in the name of religion by people using the Lord's name in vain? He says a particular resilient strain of this virus is racism. For centuries, racism has been institutionalized, codified into law, custom, and practice. The idea behind this, and I'm just a sidebar here, the idea behind this that it is, it's mixed into the batter of being human. And it's mixed into the fabric of it. And so all the things that we set up as human beings tend to have a thread of racial injustice in it. Um, systematic sin, he goes on, is not new. Scripture highlights it and portrays how ethnocentrism corrupted by the Egyptian, Persian, and Roman empires existed. He says, sadly, in our nation, the intolerable, poli intoler 
sorry, intolerable police misconduct that ended George Floyd's life is also not new. In 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. declared, we can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of, of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. What is new, however, is how social media captures and exposes the horror of in living color for all to see. Nevertheless, on days like this, we must wonder what has this new exposure actually changed in our world and within the body of Christ. He says, yesterday, many of us watched the video of George Floyd pleading for his life as an officer mercilessly knelt on his neck, using his body weight to constrict and then stop the breath in his body, which ended his life. We had hoped Eric Garner would be the last black man we had to witness plead for his life in this manner, wailing, I can't breathe, as an officer exerted deadly force. We prayed that Garner's tragic death would be sort of an injection to the treat this virus, but lamentably, it wasn't. Infectious diseases are resistant to treatment and must and we must realize that the only cure for this pandemic is the gospel. We must reexamine our discipleship, I mean, how we follow Jesus and the structures of that, and recommit ourselves to racial righteousness. Racial, racial rightness, righteousness. Righteousness is living in harmony together. So when we talk about righteousness, that God gives us righteousness, God gives us uh, a right relationship with him, okay? Racial righteousness is, is a right relationship with each other. He goes on. Yeah, I need to find where I am. So again, less than two weeks after bemoaning Ahmaud Arbery's murder, we petitioned yet again, asking the spirit of God to renew our minds. We join the psalmist in crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. And here's the last paragraph. As the Evangelical Covenant Church, that's what we're a part of. We grieve the death of George Floyd. We lament that the pandemic of systematic racism has not been allowed to grow in our nation, but has established a foothold in too many churches, fomented by some and ignored by others. The ECC, that's our denomination, will not ignore the sin of racism, a virus that has plagued our world for long, far too long. We call on all covenanters, to grieve with those who are grieving. We grieve not only the death of George Floyd, but a system that affords some luxury of being treated with dignity when the law is broken, while others go to the morgue. In the middle of this brokenness and our lament, we continue to stand firm in our faith, knowing that amid what feels like despair, we are not without hope because Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Our Lord and Savior has inaugurated the kingdom, disarming the powers and authorities. And while the kingdom has not been fully manifested, we, pers we persevere in faith knowing that it one day will. And so that's a, a, a letter from our, our president of our denomination. And I just want to say this, church, this is Pentecost Sunday. The book of Acts highlights the Holy Spirit's power, and the Holy Spirit's power is, a, is able to compel people, uh, compel the people of God to do what we cannot do on our own, and honestly would not do on our own. That's what the Spirit does. The Spirit heals and transforms and challenges and convicts us. And so here's what I'm praying for today. I'm praying for the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit to be with you and at work within you, each of you today. 
And I pray that the Spirit would empower and embolden you to, to have difficult but needed conversations. Maybe some difficult and needed conversations in you and with each other. I, I would encourage you to, to step into and engaging this conversation. Like, what would it look like? What would confession in this regard look like for you? What would repentance, what would it look like to lament what we're struggling with as a, as a nation, as a world with this? And um, I, I don't know what else to say. I'm on a journey personally in this. And um, I want to... I want to be on this journey with you, my suburban friends. <laughs> and um, so here's what we're going to do. I know this is different than what you were expecting, but we're actually going to go into um, our breakout groups and really we're just going to pray together. Can we just do that? Can we lament together? Can we pray for... George Floyd's family, can we pray for, can we pray that our eyes would be opened? And then we'll come back together and finish out our time together, okay? Hey everybody, good to see you back. Thanks for your flexibility. Um, we will continue on with Ecclesiastes next week. But we are not going to stop talking about this either. So I just want you to know that I'm going on a journey with this, um, this whole conversation. And there's some things that I'm going to be pursuing and reading and conversations I'm going to be having. And since I'm going on the journey, so are you, just FYI, because that's how this works. <laughs> Most of the time, I wrestle with something um, you get to as well. Yay for you. Um, so, hey, a, a couple of things, just uh, uh, little bits and reminders. If you missed the beginning of the call, we are having a conversation this week as the leadership and staff to talk about what the summer looks like for a restoration, okay? So there's a lot of factors at play. The governor's orders, the city and, and county, um, the Arvada Center. Um, and then we have to start making the conversation, like what does it really look like for us as a church? We started having the conversation with you last week. Um, what we wanna be is unified. We want to be together. And some of that really means that we're, we're going to have to have a lot of patience. Okay? And patience is hard. I know you're Zoom fatigued, many of you. Um, but we want to come out of this as the United Church family. Uh, we don't want to come out of this as pointing fingers about masks and all the things that we could really have a have in our way and so um some of you are gonna love what we're gonna do the next two months some of you are gonna be frustrated by it um but we're gonna love each other through it okay so um i just wanted to just encourage you hang in there keep loving your neighbors and your family um, find ways to sit in, in, in the mess that, that this conversation, you know, uncovers. Um, and um, let's just, let's be believing that the Holy Spirit does a work in us as individuals and as a community. Um, and love and wave at those henshaws as well, because... Um, we love them so, so much. Uh, 